Hi, this is Adam Elio Berkowitz. I am very pleased to be here with my dear friend, Josh Wander. Um, Josh Wander has the inside track on everything having to do with Geula. I have a feeling that um, when the Mashiach comes, Josh is going to be the one to introduce me to him. Uh, Josh lives on the Mount of Olives, so it is indeed most likely. Um, Josh is also, he's he's got semi-official and official roles in several branches of government. He just came back from, uh, are you an officer in the IDF? I'm a warrant officer in the IDF. I'm an officer in the U.S. Air Force Auxiliary. Okay. Um, and he understands these official things. And he told me that he was aware of, there's a, there's a document that's been running around uh, in Hebrew um, that some people who, who don't even understand Hebrew and don't know what they're talking about, claim shows that there was a request to make the red heifer ceremony sacrifice, even though it's not a sacrifice, on Passover. Um, so, Josh, did you see that document? I did indeed. And it shows that those pesky Jews want to incite the Arabs to violence yet again by performing the red heifer sacrifice on the Temple Mount um, on Passover. Um, is that what the document says? So, Elio, uh, we live in Israel, which is uh, is uh, as close to democracy as you're going to get, uh, at least in this region of the world. And we have uh, laws and we have law enforcement. And part of that is when you uh, want to hold a rally, uh, you need to submit a, a request from the Israeli police asking for permission for uh, conducting some sort of large rally. Uh, this uh, it would be anything from a demonstration to if you had a big uh, event outside. Um, it's, it's something that is done every day uh, all over the country. Uh, every year, right before Passover, a document is submitted to the Israeli police by different people asking for permission to have a rally on the Temple Mount and to perform uh, the obligatory uh, commandment of the Paschal sacrifice. This year is no different than previous ones, and that document was submitted to the Israeli police. I suspect that just like in previous years where the police have denied the request, that it will be denied again this year, unfortunately, but, uh, but this has absolutely nothing to do with the uh, red heifers, the red heifer is something which is not a sacrifice. It's not done on the Temple Mount. It's certainly not uh, done on Passover, nothing, and it's, it's not it, done on Passover. There's no no connection to this to this request that was made uh, to the Israeli police. Right, and they it's interesting they requested for ten thousand people. Um, so this this was clearly done by people. I mean, who not only don't know anything about what's happening with the red heifer. They don't know anything about the red heifer. It's, it's, as, if, it's as if I doubt they've ever read the, the verses in the Bible. Um, and they certainly don't know about performing the red heifer, which is not a simple subject. It's actually one of the more incredibly complicated uh, subjects in the Bible. Um, so, uh, so Most Jews don't know about it, so definitely most non-Jews would have trouble with it. <laughs> right, most uh, Jews most don't Jews, even know that, what's that... happening with the red heifer. I'm saying that even most Jews that can read Hebrew and, and do understand the, the verses in the scripture uh, have difficulty understanding how this works. Uh, it's something that it's a it's a ceremony that hasn't been performed in uh, in thousands of years of exile. Um, so most people, there's no one alive today that's ever seen it. So it's something that's new to us all. And uh, but there are basic fundamental requirements one of which is that it has to be slaughtered and burnt on the Mount of Olives where I live, not on the Mount Temple Mount. And uh, it, it is, maybe there's some confusion because according to Talmudic sources, you have to be able to see into the temple from the location on the Mount of uh, Olives, which is directly across to its east. But, uh, but like I said, the document is very clear that it's requesting permission for a paschal sacrifice to be brought uh, as uh, required by Jewish law on the Temple Mount. Yeah, you're, 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 
you're much nicer than I am. I'm just like, these people hate Jews. They hate the Bible. They hate God and they're lying. Um, you're much nicer than I am. I, I don't think you would go quite that far. Um, I don't know what their intentions are. I could just tell you that they're, they're wrong if they're saying uh, anything different than what we're, we're okay. saying. So. Um, also, I want to emphasize, this is not the Temple Institute. This is Return to the Temple Mount movement. Totally different set of people. They have nothing to do with the red heifer. They do make this request every year. I was always a bit suspicious of them. And then I spoke to Rafael Morris, um, who was one of the heads of the organization. Really nice guy and not a crazy guy. Just the guy who's like, look, I'm doing what God told me to do. Um, oh, and, you wouldn't know it from his police record, but uh, he, he is a very nice guy. <laughs> you know, he, he does get arrested every every year on the eve of Passover, trying to sneak in a uh, a lamb or a goat, but not a red heifer. City but to... not a red heifer. <laughs> I don't think he could. It's hard to sneak a red. You know, a lamb. <laughs> you could yeah. hide it in a little <laughs> box or under your box or in your trunk. A, a red heifer is not so easy to hide. Yeah, no, he's um, and I, 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 I really, I've learned to appreciate him, which is, you know, we can't just lift up our hands and say, oh well, the temple was, it got destroyed, never going to be again. We don't have that option. Um, it's written in the Torah. The Torah hasn't changed since it came down from Sinai, and it tells us to bring sacrifices, tells us to do the red heifer, tells us to keep kosher, tells us to wear a seat seat. So we keep doing it. That's what we do. I mean, thank God. It's a beautiful thing. One of the fundamentals, according to Maimonides, one of the 13 fundamentals of our faith is that the Torah that was received on Sinai uh, will not change. It has not changed and it will not change in the future. There will not be any changes to the Torah. Our commandments are the commandments and uh, it's not going to be updated. It's not going to be uh, reversed. It's not going to be redacted. It is, uh, it is what it is, and uh, we have to understand it and apply it to each generation, but the, the, the scripture itself will never change. Yeah, and it's not optional, and it's not multiple choice, so we keep uh, doing it as you know every year. Um, that being said, Passover is coming up. I'm really looking forward. Every year, except for COVID, there are um, reenactments of the Passover offering. Um, do you know anything about that? Is it, is it going to happen? Do. Oh, okay. When is it, it going to happen? When is it going to happen? It's going to happen uh, next Thursday. Okay. Uh, again, as it does every year for the past over decade, um, we've been having a reenactment of the Paschal sacrifice. Uh, it is done solely for educational purposes. It's not done uh, in its proper place on the Temple Mount. So therefore... Um, it's, it, it wouldn't be, even if it was done at the right time, uh, in the right way, it still wouldn't be kosher for the Paschal sacrifice because it's not done right. in the right place. Like Jews, um, just to clarify this, Jews are, since the temple was, uh, built, uh, here in Jerusalem, Jews are not allowed, according to Jewish law, to bring a sacrifice anywhere but the place of the altar on the Temple Mount. Non-Jews are permitted to do this. Uh, as we know, we, we've actually uh, been at an event here on my mountain, the Mount of Olives, where a non-Jew did bring a sacrifice that is permitted. But for Jews, it is it is completely. If if I can uh, if I can make that if I can tighten that up just a tiny bit, non-Jews um, can bring a sacrifice um, anywhere they want, except for the Temple Mount, um, and that sacrifice that we were at that I forgot that you were at as well was a Noahide sacrifice re reinforcing um, or at least a uh, sacrifice in the name of the covenant that was made with Noah and his sons and God. That's funny that you should forget I was there. If there was a sacrifice brought on my mountain, obviously I'm going to be there. But, yeah, uh, yeah. But yes, <laughs> of course I'll be there. But anyways, that is uh, so therefore, the reenactment, in fact, the, one of the first things they do during the reenactment is they announce over the microphone that this is a reenactment. This is just for educational purposes. It is not the actual uh, Paschal sacrifice. And, and I have to, I don't want to get too nuanced here. 
But if one were to say that a uh, lamb or a goat is is the paschal sacrifice, that actually sanctifies it. Uh, that that makes it uh, sac. What is the word? Well, sanctified. Sa no, not sanctified is another word. Um, to to the to the uh, to be used as a sacrifice on the, in the temple on the temple mount, and therefore. Um, it cannot be used for anything else. And uh, there are serious uh, violations of the Torah for anyone that uh, say, takes something that is sanctified to the temple and uses it for other purposes. So we're very careful to make sure that we never say that something is for a sacrifice unless it actually is being used as a sacrifice. But Josh, don't you get a little lamby every year? Do I get what? Don't you go out and get a little lamb every year? So it is our practice to have uh, sheep uh, and or goats every year prepared for the Paschal sacrifice. Um, it is an obligatory commandment in the Torah for Jews to bring a sacrifice on Passover. That obligation is a very serious one. If one neglects if one, uh, if one is, let me put it a different way. If one is able to bring in the sacrifice and does not, there is a very, very serious punishment involved in that. Um, and it's called karet. It's being called cut, cutting off from the Jewish people. Um, very, very serious. The high, one of the highest levels of, uh, of punishments that, that one can get. So uh, we are prepared. The reason we have not done it so far is because it, it is in a place where we are uh, currently restricted from going. So um, for 54 years, the, the Jewish people have taken over and have been in charge of the Temple Mount, but they the government not had the backbone to allow Jews to start to bring the sacrifices again. Right. So therefore, we are not able to bring it physically. So therefore, we are not uh, in violation of this. But uh, we still have to be prepared because if... Uh, and we hope it will happen this year. Um, if all of a sudden we find out, we get back the the uh, the request from the police, and they say, "Go right ahead, you have permission." Uh, or if we have a change in government, or we have a, a government that decides, the prime minister that wakes up one morning and decides to do the right thing and give us permission to access the place of the altar, then we will be able to bring it yet so, this year. So, if on the eve of Passover. Um, Bibi Netanyahu and Netanyahu Net and Gantz look at each other and go, "Oh, maybe we should do a, a, a Passover offering." Oh, but where were we going to get one? You'll just step forward and say, "Hey, homie, don't sweat it. I got you covered." Okay. <laughs> it has nothing to do with Gantz. Um, the only one that can get permission to do this is the Prime Minister himself, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. But you not do it, by the way, is a Levite himself. He has yes. a place and a, and, and a it's some. He has uh, his own job in in the in the temple service and um and we hope that he does he, he does the right thing he does chuva he repents and he and he allows the jewish people to do what they're what they've been waiting to do for thousands of years uh in exile so i have a question the passover sacrifice according to what you're saying and according to what a lot of people are saying who i trust um they say that the only thing stopping us from bringing the Passover offering, which is the most important offering, arguably, that bears the punishment of Harriet if you don't do it. The only thing stopping us is the Israeli government. Raphael Morris, he actually told me that the reason why they do this is because it's not, they want to they wanna manifest, to express blatantly and openly, it's not our fault. The, the, it's, it's the government's fault. We want to bring it and they won't let us. Um, I have a question. The Corbin, the, the... I just can I can I can, can I clarify something else first? Sure. You, you would need to have not only the access to the place, but you need to have an altar in place, which will take time. It's not something that happens in 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 uh, thirty minutes. Um, you have to prepare an altar in advance. By the way, the altar does not interfere with this, the current structures that are, just to make right. it clear, it, it right. does not interfere with the, the Dome of the Rock or Al-Aqsa Mosque or any of the structures that are currently there. And you could put an altar um, down and, and take it away in, 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 in a matter of hours. You can do that. So so uh, it has to be prepared in advance. You would have to have 
um, a people that are Kohanim that uh, would be dressed in the, the the special garb that they they wear, um, their temple garb, and they would have to have amongst them a shochet, a, a, a someone who knows how to do ritual slaughter, you know, and and a knife obviously prepared. In fact, Rabbi Rabbi Ariel, um, once told me because um, for like I said, for many years we've been having preparing these uh, sheep and goats in, in preparation of the Paschal sacrifice. Um, and one of the years I said to him, you know, I went over, I said, Rabbi, we have we have the sheep and the goats prepared. He said, but do you do you have the knife? Ooh. So I said, I said, that's a good point. So that, that year I went out and I bought a, a special knife. Get out for of the here. purpose. <laughs> so I have actually I have three knives right now currently set aside for that. Um, so we have the knives, we have the sheep, we have the goats, we have the altar. We just need to have, like I said, permission to access the right place. Josh, when I grow up, I want to be just like you. You're amazing. <laughs> You're really awesome. And I am absolutely not kidding around. That level of commitment to just doing God's will is really, it's inspiring. It's It gives me a, a feeling of, of I'm alive and, and, and Gaula is happening. It's really, it's amazing. It is happening. It, it is, is happening. happening. <laughs> uh, and, 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 and I love uh, Rafael Morris to death. <laughs> Um, but but with all due respect to him and his his organization, I I, I believe that it's more of a PR stunt than anything else, mm. because they try their best to to sneak into the old city right. and they're yeah. very creative. In one, the ways one they year do they it. even they um, even paid people. They were saying you know a reward. This you know I think it was like ten thousand right. shekels if you take a goat or a sheep up to the up to the temple. Mount, the something the like problem that. is the the problem is uh, Elio if. if if your listeners understood what we've been saying until now, the problem is that if, if if let's say they they make it through the old city gates and they get somehow somehow they get onto the Temple Mount and they have this this baby lamb or uh, or a goat, um, so right then they've made themselves obligated to bring the sacrifice theoretically because they're in the right place with the right time with the right with the right but they don't have a Kohen. They don't have the knife. They don't have the garments. And they don't the, have and with the, the and with the they, metal they, detectors. They the with all the metal no, detectors, is not a my chance. My point is, yeah. even even if they got up there, then it's not real because they wouldn't be able to do it anyway. So so right. it's, I I I, be, I believe this is my personal opinion that having everything prepared in advance outside is the way to go. Right. Again, as a PR stunt, it's nice, but it but it's not. I don't think it's very realistic. That they're actually going to be able to get up to the Temple Mount and and bring the capital sacrifice in the way that they're doing it. But I, again, I, really, I, I I I'm happy with what they uh, that they're I, they're bringing edu educating people and bringing this to light so people know about it. I, I really I really think uh, I I very much appreciate um, your approach because uh, Judaism is all about halacha mitzvahs. It's all about you know using the mind, learning, um, preparation. Um, and not just jumping and doing it halfway. We're talking about serving God. You have to do it correctly. Also, it reminds me in all- well, It's very practical. It's not like you could just yeah. fly a drone yeah. over or drop a, a lamb down on, on the Temple Mount. I'm not trying to give anybody any, any it ideas. Also... But it, it's, not, it's not just a matter of getting a, a sheep up there. Like I said, there's, there's a lot of preparations involved in the Paschal Sacrifice. Um, and it's something that it can do be done by certain people at certain times in a certain place in certain ways and it's not something that you could just sneak up uh, sneak up a sheep or a goat and and, and do it right. and so, what okay. rav ariel so. said i mean rav ariel is a massive tzaddik every time i meet him i i literally quake in my boots there aren't too many people um i just i i can't think straight when i'm around him he's just you can you can feel how holy he is and how connected to to god's will he's 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 an incredible man uh who's done incredible things in the world um, oh, he's God. more than that. He is, he, he's 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 a he is a trailblazer because before Rabari L and the Temple Institute, nobody ever thought to put all these ideas into practice. Right. And and even though, like I said, we don't always see eye to eye on everything with the Temple Institute and Rabari L, I could tell you very clearly that he is a trailblazer. He has managed to bring back to the Jewish world and the, the world as a whole, 
the idea that these laws, these biblical laws are, are practical laws that can be done today. And, you know, it's funny, his words to you, I, I get the feeling whenever I speak to incredibly holy, holy, holy men, and sometimes women, um, though I try not to speak too much to women, um, whenever I speak to these incredibly holy men, you have to understand that there's... That was incredibly not politically correct, what you just said, but okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> that their words have a lot more meaning and weight than when you're speaking to a regular person. I remember once there was a Rav on Bahrain, um, in Bahrain, his name was Rav God, and he was just like, I mean, the man, everyone knew he was he was what he was. And like one time he stopped by and he was standing in front of the yeshiva and he reached down and he said, look at all these weeds. And he started pulling the weeds up and he said, you know, you have to pull up the weeds from the roots or they'll just keep coming back. I thought that the rabbis in the yeshiva knew that. And all of a sudden I realized he wasn't just talking about weeds. I was like, boom. So Rav, Rav Ariel, when he said to you, you know, well, you have the goat, where's the knife? He's not the first person who ever said that. Isn't that what Isaac said to Abraham at the Akedah, at the binding? That's true. But but I but I think that uh, and he and he did have the knife, and, and he, he did, did have the fire knife. and 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 it, yeah. So why did he ask um, where's the knife? You know, that's a great question, and that's probably for another video. Yeah. But what I can <laughs> say is that that uh, that Rav Ariel is is very practical. Yes. So when when Rabbi Ariel is speaking about a sacrifice, he doesn't just leave it to okay, we're going to sneak a goat into the old city. He wants to know every step, how it's going to be done, who's going to do it, with what utensils is are going to be used, what vessels are going to be used, and that's what the whole the whole idea of the Temple Institute is to is to yeah. recreate all of these vessels and and prepare the garments and have everything ready, find who the the proper um, lineage of Kohanimar in order to be able to actually perform practically these commandments today. Right. They, they, they treat it. It's, it's funny. And um, this might be a little difficult for my Christian viewers, but when we talk about the temple and we talk about the sacrifices, um, we understand that there's lessons to be learned from them, but they're not an allegory. They are commandments, meaning they're marching orders telling us what to do. So we're not talking about, you know, a sacrifice representing the, the no, it's specifically written. The red heifer is to cleanse us not from sin. The red heifer is to cleanse us from ritual impurity from a dead body. The, the Passover offering is not a sin offering. It's not to replace Jesus who who you think who you believe died for your sins. The the Passover lamb is a thanksgiving offering to thank God for bringing my ancestors out of Egypt, and had he not, I would still be there. It's not an allegory. It is pretty explicitly explained. Um, so that's... that's... Um, I'm not sure who you're saying, you too. But uh, yeah, obviously there are also sin offerings. And yeah. those are something like, like just, we started off saying... Just not the red heifer or the, the Passover offering. The Torah is not going to change. Right. right. The Torah is not going to change, and the sin offers, offerings... Uh, need to be restored as well. And, and, and you're, and you're right, right that, that in a certain level, Rav Ariel was, was amazingly visionary in that he was one of the first Jews who said, you know something, the Torah is not an allegory. So when the Torah speaks about the temple and the tabernacle and the and the sacrifices and the red heifer and the and the uh, incense and all these other things. It's not an allegory. They're marching orders. We got to get down to business. We got to make the things like they're described. It's time to get 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 working. And he was one of the very first people who did that. Um, and that, I think that was because he got a head start. He was on the Temple Mount. He conquered the Temple Mount as a soldier, um, as a young man. So that's what we're trying to continue. We're not, it's, and what's crazy, it has, it has nothing to do with Christianity um, in any way. It's not saying, it's not trying to invalidate Christianity. It's not trying to make a commentary on the theology of Christianity. We're just Jews trying to be Jews, which is why I find it so insulting when people who don't even know the Bible are twisting what Jews are doing as Jews. It's, I think it's hugely insulting. 
Um, and that, <laughs> that was a little more, <laughs> one of the reasons I like talking to you is we, is, is I don't get angry as much. <laughs> and that's about as close to getting angry as I want. Um, so hopefully I'll be seeing you at the, uh, at the reenactment or the practice run. Um, just that one thing I remember one year, they, one of the reasons for doing this is to get ready. It is not um, to, to learn and relearn um, how to do things practically. So for example, one year they, there's a commandment that you roast the Passover lamb, which is basically your, your Thanksgiving dinner. Um, you sit down with your family and everyone gets a piece of meat um, and you roast it on a pomegranate branch. And they really had to work at it for quite a while until they learned how to do that properly. You know, the, the Bible says roast this. It's not so easy. On a practical level, it's not so easy. Um, and they had to relearn that. So that's one example. They had to relearn. Um, I was sitting next to you. you. You dragged me to this, and I thank you a thousand times over. Um, the Tola Achani, this, this crimson wool. Um, I saw, um, was it Rabbi Rosenberg? Um, the Nazir, I think. He did it right in front of our eyes, you know. Friedman. Friedman, Rabbi Friedman. Five feet in front of my face. I'm watching the Tulat Shani, the biblical crimson wool, just all of a sudden shoo, get its color right in front of my eyes. But they had to really work at it to figure out to use alum. And it, it was it was a very complicated process. They had to relearn. And that's what we're doing in these reenactments. Um and the, we're also getting closer and closer every year. Yes. Uh, both yes. Uh, both in understanding what needs to be done and educating, as well as geographically. The, the first years, I think, were in Kiryat Moshe neighborhood of uh, Jerusalem. Way out there in the suburbs. Uh, <laughs> and there might have, might have been a dozen people at the first uh, first one. Uh, and it has continued, continued to grow in both number and getting closer and closer to the actual Temple Mount right. where the sacrifice will be brought. Um, so in, in in recent years, we've had it um, right next to the Western Wall or the Southern Wall by the by the Davidson Park. Um, we've had it right right abutting the, the Temple Mount. So we're definitely closer. Like I said, there sometimes we have We've had ones that have a, almost a thousand people come to uh to, to right. The event. I was there one year they did the it. Chief right. rabbis. Yeah. yeah. Um, we're talking about some, it, it. It has come a long way in the decade that we've been there doing these reenactments. And you know, I keep I I, I remember um, might have been last year or the year before um, that Rav Yehuda Glick went up to the Temple Mount and he in Elul and in, and in, in the month of Elul we have a a a, a practice a custom to blow the shofar, to wake people up to do tshuva. So he had a, the sound of a shofar on his cell phone in his pocket, and the police arrested him. And... Detained him. Detained him, right. They couldn't arrest him. What was the charge? So he went down outside of the Temple Mount and blew the shofar. And there were a couple people with him, and they arrested them and put them in front of the judge. And the judge said, so what's the charge? It's, it's against the law to blow a shofar in Jerusalem? And so I so, was one of those people that was uh, right. That was uh, detained. I was actually let go. I wasn't brought in front of a judge, but um, but I could tell you that it's uh, it, it, it's 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 there are powers out there that do not want this to happen. And I'm not talking right. from right. the non-Jewish the world, but within the Jewish world. And uh, we spoke about it a little bit last time, both from the the secular um jewish world as well as maybe some parts of the orthodox jewish world that rather this not happen but and it's, it's funny that it's, there's a there's a concept in learning gemara called gilui milta which is when things become revealed by you know through various means this i think really shows what they're, what are they against are they against jews in jerusalem blowing the shofar in jerusalem somewhere it has nothing to do with the temple mount um, and that's the opposition so, is to the to the process of the redemption. It, that's and they they, they either feel that it shouldn't happen or it shouldn't happen so quickly, or it shouldn't happen. It certainly in this shouldn't way. happen now, um, God so, forbid. <laughs> and I think nice. that's there's there was there was always a little pushback, um, getting to be more and more um up to the to the Passover reenactment. Because it's like, oh, and so what's your claim? We shouldn't do 
a reenactment in Jerusalem somewhere. You know, what's their claim? They end up looking silly. Um, what I think was very interesting was when I went to Shiloh um, a couple of weeks ago to the Red Heifer Conference, um, there were some very unsavory anti- That was banned by Hezbollah. That was right. That was banned by Hezbollah and Hamas. And um, CBS News wrote a horribly inaccurate, full of lies um, article about the Red Heifers. And then they tried to send a film crew. Um, to to the to the actual conference, which was after the uh, article, and uh, Rabbi Machover um, turned them away, um, and um, another film crew showed up, or rather, a photographer and a reporter. Um, they were from Haaretz, and Haaretz is incredibly left wing, and I was kind of surprised. Self hating Jews. Self hating. Just left wing. Well, you know something? They let them in. And I recognize the photographer from previous events. Um, actually, a very nice guy. Uh, one of the times we did Nisuch the the water libation ceremony, we were down in Shiloach, and they, the, the, the Kohanim were bending down to fill up the golden vessel with water. And he literally took off his shoes and socks and jumped into the water to get a better picture of it. And I was talking with him at, the, at Shiloh, at the Red Heifer thing. And he was like, I'm really interested in this stuff. And he's been covering it for years. And the thing is, it used to always be um, extremist religious fanatics who were looking to incite war in the region. And he was just like, no. Nah. And that language of extremist fanatics has, for the most part, um, been disappeared. I think because more and more- Not at all. You, don't, you obviously don't read Hiratz. Okay. Uh, it's, uh, and you're, you're talking about a photographer versus the editorial board I'll, there, I'll, 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 which is... I'll, I'll buy you a beer. I'm going to look it up after we get off this video. And if it turns out that they said religious fanatics, I'll buy you a beer. And you should, know, and you should know that the um, that when it comes to photographers in, 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 in particular, um, they, regardless of their personal opinions, they try to be nice to everybody. Because oh, okay. they always want to be first on the scene and they want to take the pictures and they want they want right. They're not the ones that are creating editorial policy though. They're they're just taking the pictures and getting paid for taking photographs. So which, which um, explains why it, I'm a writer. Yeah, I'm not nice to he, might, he might be a great guy. <laughs> he might be a great guy, but but Haaretz is not a good paper. I I do not that's, recommend it. That's to very true. There I call them uh I call them uh Der Sturmer. Um, from from <laughs> published in the heart of Tel Aviv, um, they they are pretty bad. But I I but a, a lot of people and there's another um, Yemenite Israeli woman who speaks English who goes to a lot of these events. Um, I think the there are more and more Israelis, um, even secular Israelis, who are open to what's happening. I mean, soldiers who aren't religious wearing tzitzit and. And um, more than half, even before the war, more than half of the Israelis um, supported Jewish prayer on the Temple Mount. So I think we're headed in that direction. So far as the um, public, so far as the Israeli public, I think we're. Headed I think that, that October seventh has uh, super boosted that. I mean, absolutely, that, the, 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 absolutely, we've come a long way. Absolutely, um, and both and... ridding us of divisions, and and of uh, and recognizing that we need to have a a national vision. And if you look at the number of, of uh, Jews who ascended to the Temple Mount um, over the past decade, it's growing exponentially. It's it's a it's a hockey stick. Um, and I think that that's I mean, you don't just it's not another tourist site. You go to the Temple Mount because of the temple. Um, I, I'm, I, I remember when, you know, years ago I was working with people from but one when one goes, one has to be ritually pure. If a, a Jewish person goes up to the Temple Mount, they need to be ritually pure and they need right. to know the laws. They need to know where they're allowed to go and not go. Likewise, if a non-Jew goes, they don't have to worry about the ritual purity part of it, but they, they need to know, know where they're allowed and not allowed to go on the mountain. Sure. Uh, I remember a bunch of years ago, I was working in a restaurant and the manager was uh, from Tel Aviv and he was raised in an anti-religious kibbutz which I don't know if people in America are aware of that. There are anti-religious um, Israelis. Um, and I once said, you know, hey, I'm going to Hebron next week, to Hebron, to the Machpelah, to visit Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, 
and uh, you know, Sarah, um, Sarah Rifka and uh, um, hey, Rebecca, hey, Rebecca. Yeah. <laughs> and I said, do you want to come? And he said to me, no, I don't leave Israel. And I was like, you don't leave Israel. And he said, yeah, and that's not Israel. That's the occupied territories. And I was floored. And this was a man who had, I couldn't believe it. The week before, he had just come back from a tour of Italy to, it was it, it was a gourmet tour of Italy to um, taste all of the regional sausages. So this was a guy who just spent two weeks um, eating pork in Rome. <laughs> And, and he wouldn't go to the cave of the patriarchs because it meant leaving Israel. I mean, there are people like that. I'm hoping fewer and fewer. And I'm sure that he has since done true. My, my 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 guess is that the pet patriarchs and matriarchs wouldn't be happy to see him either. So it's okay. I I'm not so sure that's true. I think the patriarchs would be glad to see any of their 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 babies. I think <laughs> they're 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 pork pork they're pork eating. Uh... Roman babies, I think that they would uh, be preferred to. I'm not so sure. I think they would love anyway. Anyway, Josh, um, my wife is calling me to probably make the uh, make the beef for Shabbos tonight. Um, we got asado. We're going to have a lovely Shabbos meal. I've been away all week, so this is going to be fun. Um, Josh, thank you so much. I hope to see you next week. Um, also, in what kind of meat are you making? Is it Red Angus? It's... <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't that be nice can you imagine you know order your red angus red heifer steak online wow you know uh, I, i'm still hoping <laughs> i'm still hoping that whichever red heifers are deemed uh, not kosher for for sacrifice purposes for for the use in the ceremony of the red heifer uh, i'm still hoping to get some of that steak because it, 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 it they've got to be amazing oh I mean, my they, gosh they are, Oh fed very well and and they're treated very well and they're they they are probably going to be the tastiest uh the tastiest beef i mean the uh, alternative the side as i was a dairy farmer i'd like to see them in a field up here in the golan where i live just being happy cows that would that would make my day so <laughs> but anyway anyway josh thank you so much i hope to see you next week also um just prior to a meat meal <laughs> god willing <laughs> Okay, Josh, thanks so much. Be blessed, y'all. Have a wonderful Shabbat. Be well.